morning, and thank you for coming. Um, before we start today, we just wanted to take a moment of silence um, for the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg that we all suffered last night. Okay, and off that note, again, thanks for coming. Um, my name is Alex Saucier. I am here with Jade Warpenberg today, um, and we're going to be talking about cinematography. Uh, a couple questions, and I don't have the best memory, so I'm going to read them. Um, so, first of all, how did you get interested in cinematography? Like, what was the thing that led you to just pick up a camera the first time? Yeah, so I would say that I definitely didn't have like a super traditional start like I wasn't the type of kid who was like you know interested in like the you know I wasn't super interested in not like watching movies I was playing soccer and through high school I played soccer and I went to college to play soccer and so as far as me applying myself in that like the film world and realm like I really was like so f that was like the back like the last thing I probably could have thought I would I'd be doing at this point in my career um, and so you know when I was going to college like I took a couple elective classes, and one of them was like just a general film studies, and that was probably like the first time, at least in my academic career, that like I ever felt like a spark or like an interest. Like I was always a pretty average student; like I never applied myself to too many things. But something in that class kind of like changed, um, and then uh, I went from there, quit soccer. Um, started taking more film classes. I went to Eastern's film program, and and I from there I kind of like then you know really honed in on the cinematography side, um, and I stayed at Eastern for a couple of years and went up to Vancouver, went to their film school, and then after I graduated, just stayed up there for another year and like immersed myself in everything. Like I you know most of the projects were were free as most you know film students after the first couple of years they kind of just do and and I learned a lot I made a lot of mistakes um, but at the end of the day like I I definitely grew from that experience um, so yeah like I, I would say that like I, it was it was almost by mistake or coincidence that I kind of fell into to film and I'm you know I'm happy that I did because I couldn't really see myself doing anything else yeah a quick follow-up question what was like the thought, or at what moment in your career did you decide, okay, I'm not going to take free projects anymore. I'm only going to do, or primarily going to do things um, for pay. Yeah, that's that's a really, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, it was a tricky balance for me because, like, you know, I, I think I think early on in my career, um, and I'm, I'm I assume most people's, is that the lack of confidence is definitely there and and with that you kind of like you kind of like value your self-worth and and say like well if i keep on doing free projects then eventually i'll get there um to the point where i can you know ask for a decent amount, decent rate or whatever but it's also like where where do you start that um and so and so that it took me a while it took me a long time um, um and and up until i moved back to spokane and i started to surround myself with people who who saw that kind of talent and confidence and i think that's when that changed or clicked in in my own you know belief that like yeah maybe i maybe i do deserve to 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 make a living to some degree um um and and i guess that it's it's it was you know pro and con of that is that because i i was I grew up um, in my career that way. Like I never really, you know, had a super big head or anything. Like I think that most people that I work with now, like I think that's the thing that they kind of appreciate is that I'm definitely there to bring everyone else's, you know, confidence up and and um, you know because that was the same exact thing that the people that. I first worked with when I moved back to Spokane did did to me, yeah. yeah. Cool. 
Um, do you have any personal mentors in film or anyone that you like to emulate? Um, as, f as far as like, um, you know, a mentor, like I had one growing uh, uh, when I went, was up, up in Vancouver um, that he was like a pretty, as far as like 80s and 90s, um, you know, he was, he was over in China and like he was there kind of, you know, when, when Jackie Chan was like first, it was, it's funny because like, yeah, when Jackie Chan was like first kind of breaking it big over there, he was definitely, he was like, you know, doing a lot of second unit stuff. Mm -hmm. And so I think not really from a stylistic or from like just a visual standpoint, he was a mentor, but just as far as like work ethic and, and st strictly work ethic, like he, you know, he like beat you into the ground and, and there was, there weren't, there were a lot of points where I was like, well, why, like, why am I being taught by this guy, as most young kids probably think, but, you know, it, it, after a year or so being under him, um, I finally, I, I definitely saw the value in that, and that, like, you know, uh, he, he was, he, he started in film in, in a period where, like, you don't, yeah, there's no real handouts. There's none, none of that stuff. Um, and and so like there's as far as a mentor, he's definitely one of them. And then as far as an influence right now, like uh, there's a DP, um, and she mainly does a lot of commercial work. But it's a DP called uh, Kate. Uh, uh, I'm gonna mispronounce her last name, but Kate Ariz um, And I think as far as being a modern digital cinematographer there's no one that's really doing it better than her just from a strictly visual standpoint as well as just you know I think a lot you see a lot of like the the old school and traditional DPs like they don't really have to like push themselves on like social media or anything like that because mm -hmm. they have such a they have such a uh, you know uh, place in the system already that they don't they don't have they're not really too concerned with that but I think right. that you know, now especially, like, it's not just about what you're doing, it's about how you're kind of promoting yourself to, to a certain degree. And I think that, yeah, as, as she, there's no one that's doing it better than her right, right now. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, what do you think is, is your biggest hurdle or your biggest challenge in general in being a cinematographer? Um, at the beginning, um, like I was saying, like, um, you know, confidence is is such a, was was such a big hurdle for me because, um, you know, you're in a position that you, you have to kind of uh, you definitely have to have a certain level of confidence and a certain level of communication with everyone else around you. Otherwise, you're going to lose faith in the, in those people. Um, and so that was that was definitely um, a big hurdle for me at the beginning. And, and now, like it's, um, I think I've, at least as far as in Spokane, like I've definitely had a you know a certain level of success, and like it's just kind of like, it's never I don't know it's never taken that for granted as cheesy as that might sound like, um, um, just consistently like pushing yourself within the market that you're in. Um, um, is has been difficult for me um, in in Spokane, um, um, just because it's fairly small. It's it's like fairly small compared to you know Seattle, even Seattle or Portland. But I think that that because of that, you there's such a tight knit community, um, and the, the level of uh, work that it's, we're also putting out is you know equal to that of bigger ones. But um, yeah, like there's 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 been a lot of moments um, in my in my career in Spokane that I've def I've had like you know like uh, second thoughts about being here as I feel like a lot of people in around here do, mm -hmm. and but at the end of the day like I just have to remind myself that like you know changing cities or changing. <laughs> Uh, scenery that's not gonna that's not gonna be the thing that solves all your all your issues there's so much underneath of that that you have to kind of work out you know in yourself before before you're able to to 
get past that hurdle. And and yeah, I, and I, I have I know I've known plenty of people that have had that same uh, mindset, both about Spokane and then like other similar places that they've grown up in. And then they you know the thought, just like the thought or the act of moving to a bigger market is like that's going to be the the way to instantly change everything mm -hmm. is usually not the case. Um, and so, yeah, those two things have kind of been the biggest hurdles for me. Back to the confidence piece, are there some times where you turn down a project because you're just not confident enough that you can achieve what they're asking for? Or has that been something that has gone through your head in the past? I think there's, there's probably, a, there's definitely some moments where I, where I should have done that. And like, I can go back to one, um, because um, I, I I've never like churned one down a, out of confidence, but there's one that I should have just because um, it, was when, it was when I was still in Vancouver, and like when I was still kind of going like right after I had graduated, and uh, a friend of mine through the program like was they were doing this commercial and they asked me to to um, be the gaffer on it, and like I really didn't have like I really didn't have any knowledge at that point about the actual like technical aspects of being a gaffer mm -hmm. um and so but i agreed stupidly and and that project was it was like i mean the dp has gone on to like i didn't know anything about him but i mean he's gone on to but he's like shoot like nike commercials and gatorade commercials and stuff like that so he's he was, he was i think he was pretty well known at that point but that project was so over my my head and so over like anything that i've done up to up to that point where I think that was a definitely a, a very humbling moment for for me uh, because like it was it was embarrassing how little that I, I actually knew mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's something that's one that if I were to go back I, I wouldn't I wouldn't because like I've learned so much from that but like it yeah that was one that I probably should have turned down because of I just wasn't ready for it yeah. yeah. And speaking of like the DP gaffer relationship, I know that there's a lot of DPs that come out of gaffers. Um, do you think it's important as a DP to have that experience, or at least work in the the electric department? Or? I, th I think that yeah, whether it's electrical um, camera, um, I think it's I think it's good to to get those be in that because you not only know what they're kind of going through, but also like just as far as like communicating them, communicating with them, like you know what to say and what not to say. And so I think that's, that is a, it's not super necessary, but it surely will help, you know, your, your ability to, to um, operate on set as, as a DP. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> do you have like a favorite part of the whole process of cinematography, so how you approach it when you're actually on set, the planning versus the end product? I think uh, my, my favorite part is um, I just, the, the production side of it, because like I, um, going through film school, like, you know, you get a kind of a taste of, of all departments and like just the, physical side of production mm -hmm. is something that uh, I've always, like, I've never been able to, like, sit, sit still, like, sit in an office. Um, I feel like that's why people go to some degree in, in, into film. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, just like, just like being in a location um, and, and, and doing, like, you know, physical labor to a certain degree, that has always just kind of been in, in my nature. Um, um, and then, yeah, I just, I don't know, like, you, you, you work with people so often that they, you know, there's the whole, you know, like the whole family aspect of, mm -hmm. of, of being on set. That, that is something that, you know, I wouldn't trade for anything. Like it's, it's, you know, the, the people that I've, uh, the friends that I've made through film, like have been lifelong friends and friends that, you know, when I'm doing other projects, so like the, they're the first people that I that I go to, and just like outside of film, like they're I, I couldn't ask for uh, any better people, uh, and and so they, yeah, those those would be the two things for sure that that I t have taken away from that. Yeah. And going back to saying that cinematography in a way is kind of like a physical 
I mean, it's very physical. Do you think it's important as a cinematographer, especially one that's also a camera operator, mm -hmm. which at most levels is the case, um, do you think it's important to be like in good physical shape or at least to an extent? I think to an extent for sure. I mean, like um, you, most departments, uh, like it's not, you know, it's not s super light labor. I mean, there's some pretty like strenuous situations that you're that you're putting yourself uh, that you're putting yourself in, um, um, and so like being in like decent physical shape is 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 a plus. Um, um, and, and and as a camera operator, like you know, uh, I remember after the first season of Z Nation, like I had I was carrying the, the camera on my shoulder for so many hours a day. Like I had my like I went into a massage therapist, and like my spine was like a, like a centimeter off. Like I had to get it like realigned to a certain degree. And so like there are a lot of like yeah, there are a lot of um, um, kind of. Uh, physical aim elements that come along with, with certain departments and, and camera is definitely one of them. Um, so I know that a lot of DPs face some challenges working with directors because the director of photography and the director really are a team. Um, do you have certain tips for people that are working with directors or are there challenges that you go through or also tips for people that maybe want to become a director how to work with a cinematographer um, yeah I think like the the most important thing is like um, especially uh, you know directors are supposed to be there for for the vision but you know uh, you also have to like let other people into that into that vision um, and you have to trust that the people that you're surrounding yourself with um, are are capable and and enough to, to to not only understand it but to potentially improve upon it mm -hmm. and and so th that's the biggest thing like um, it's just that um, ability to trust you know who you're working with and that they have your vision and and you know in their mind but you you go to a DP or you go to um, an art director or you go to other departments because you know their style and what they're going to bring to 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 your film or whatever and so I, and I've worked with a couple directors who definitely like it's like you know their vision is so set in stone that you're just there to basically act as this like robot like middleman like and 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 that that that, that decreases the quality so much like because you don't when you can like you can instantly feel that like you yeah. can instantly feel that like you the person that you're working with doesn't see you as an asset um they just see you more as like a body um so i think that's the biggest thing with with working with the directors is is like that ability to to, to trust uh, the people that you're that you're working with have there been times where you're working with a director and you just really disagree with something that that he's saying or that he wants or that she's saying or she wants. Um, and at some point you just kind of have to put a foot in your mouth or do you step up or does it just depend on the situation? Yeah, I think that, that um, if I'm doing, if I'm like on, on, on like the commercial side, there's definitely, um, you know, there's there's disagreements and there's things that um, I don't necessarily see as like being my the right way that I would do it. But at the end of the day, like it doesn't. Commercial is different in that you know you're you're there you're very much there to there's there's money at stake. There's a lot, a lot of things at stake, and and that I can kind of like you know um, let off the, the the gas a little bit. Um, but if I'm like, you know, doing projects with other people where, like, nothing, it's it's kind of like it's free, it's mm -hmm. passion project, whatever. Like, then yeah, I think I think my voice, um, I, I'll let my voice be heard quite a bit more. Um, so yeah, it just it just kind of depends on on the situation for sure. Yeah. So when you go to scout a location, what are the things you're looking for and paying attention to? 
Um, I mean, the biggest thing is like what that location kind of offers to the story, and um, you know, what um, that that's 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 the 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 key element is like you are you. I'm, and I remember going through like uh, when I was at Easton, like or in film school in general, like. Usually it's like, oh, is this convenient? <laughs> is this a friend's apartment that mm -hmm. has nothing on its back walls? Um, um, but now it's, it's 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 definitely like, is does this fit into the story? And then from there, um, you know, the I think as far as like the people who are scouting, you know, like you want you do you want to go there during what time of the day you think you'll be shooting? And I know with with with. Um, the the just to address like everyone that's listening like you know you might not have as many resources with you and so mm -hmm. you're going to have to rely on whatever natural light whatever practicals you're bringing with you with you um, um, which makes scouting that much more crucial to towards the process because your what you see is most likely what you're gonna have to shoot and like your ability to alter that isn't as great as someone that's coming in with a bigger budget. Uh, um, and so those, the, 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 yeah, I look at the, the time of day that we're most likely shooting in, you know, how much space we're going to need, um, um, our ability to, to, you know, shift certain things. Um, and then just from, you know, like more of a, a production side, like, you want to take into account, like if you're, you know, if you're coming with a big crew and you're like having to worry about like things like street parking mm -hmm. or or loading in or anything like that. I think those things can kind of take a backseat sometimes, and and you don't realize how big the issue is until you're like on right on on the day, and you're loading in and all this stuff is going wrong, um, and so the, you yeah I think. The mo after you do it a couple times and you make those mistakes, then you'll you, then you learn from them and hopefully, yeah. Like once you do the next one, you, you kind of like you know change your approach to to a scout because I feel like you know uh, it, it's something that I don't think I did enough when I first started. But you look at the product between when you. Are doing that, and then when you like full on, like you go into a location, you you kind of like shoot for storyboards and whatnot. Um, um, you just look at those final products, and like it's just so much more cohesive and 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 and, and also like true to what you know the director's vision want, wants to be. And and uh, just because um, and going back to the convenient thing, like. If you go to a play, if you go to a location and it doesn't work, then just keep on keep on looking. Like, don't just say like, okay, well, how many we have to scout however uh, many other locations today. So like, this will work. This will mm -hmm. be fine. And that's the last thing that you should be saying, especially if it's like a passion project. Right. Know? I think it's interesting what you said about thinking about production because I think so many DPs don't really take production into consideration. Mm -hmm. so they're like, well, it's not my problem if there's not parking or there's not adequate bathrooms. But if you can take that into consideration and you're not just thinking about your end product, but your crew mm -hmm. and just ease of how everything is going to be, I think that's a, you know, a benefit of a cinematographer that's more than just thinking about the art, but thinking about the craft as a whole. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's very true. And like, you know, I've, I've, worked with some that it's definitely and, and you know when you get to a certain level then you can have I don't want to call it like arrogance or anything but like you just don't you just don't yeah like you said like you don't take the, anyone else into account um, um, and I think that that's why like on, uh, on a whole like I switched more to the commercial side um, um, is because it's, it's generally a smaller crew like you're kind of all doing you know, you're doing lots of different things, um, and and so that level of of um, like consideration is a lot greater. I f I feel on on the commercial side than it is more the feature side, mm -hmm. but that's just my experience. Yeah. Right. Um, okay. So more technically, when you're on set and on a scout, or I guess it's probably different. But are there tools that you always want to have? with you yeah like as as far as like 
the things that I bring. Um, the first one is I have like a little, uh, it's an app on my, on my phone that it's basically like a, a, a viewfinder that you know you can have. There's uh, tons of different like camera cameras as well as lenses in there that, ba that, that give you the exact like frame that you're going to see once you put a, a camera in there. And that's, that's definitely the biggest thing or the, the number one thing that I always, always use. And then there's another app that I have um, that's uh, basically like a sun tracker. Mm -hmm. And so that'll give you like the, the, you know, the time of day, where it's gonna be, um, 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 and, ever, and you know, the angle. Um, uh, those, are the, those are the two that I use the most. Um, and, um, you know, those are, those are, are relatively, you know, inexpensive for what, what they do. Mm -hmm. um, um, but yeah, I, I think outside of those, I don't really um, bring anything initially on, on the scout. I'm more, I, I like to like, just like listen to uh, whatever, whether it's the client or the director or whatever, more so than like, um, um, kind of, express what I'm feeling at that moment. Like uh, there's plenty of time afterwards to, to, to chat with um, other people about that. Yeah. Do you usually carry a light monitor with you or at mm. least on set? No, no, I think, um, and that's something that I probably, like I remember when I, f like, when I first started and when we were shooting on, on film in, in, in film school, like I, I use that more often, but, and, and I think over the years, and this is, it's probably more of, um, just like a condition of the digital era is okay. that I feel like you don't, you just don't see him as often, but I mean, and, and, and to some degree, like I, I, I don't use it cause like I, I um, am usually like have my hands in other things and like there's, you know, there's other things on cameras like, you know, false color and, and whatnot that, that give you a rough estimate. And so I, I, I've been, I always think about, you know, using it more often, but it's never the case, it's never the case. Yeah, yeah sometimes, I mean, I'll, I'll use one sometimes if I'm scouting a location, but then I find that when I'm on set, not really using it anymore, it was just kind of to get an idea of the amount of light I was going to need to bring yeah, in, yeah, but yeah. then later. Um, so, for people that may not understand too much about set um, uh, lighting, can you explain the difference between a practical and then an off-camera light, and then in what circumstances you prefer to use practicals? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so practicals would be anything that you see within the frame, whether it's a lamp, you know, uh, lights in kitchens, street lamps, um, uh, what? Yeah, whatever is physically in the frame, it would be considered a practical. Um, and then off-camera are, are uh, you know, anything that's that's off camera and and so like if you're if if you're shooting a scene inside daytime you know and by a window usually there'll be an off camera light that's basically accentuating or motivating what would be coming from the window to to whether it's to give you the enough light to properly expose or do you need it softer do you need it harder um yeah, there's there's plenty of uses for off off camera lights, um, um, and then as far as like um, my, I, I generally try and um, um, y y motivate from practicals more often than not. Like um, I think that's because like of the films that I that I work on. Like nothing is like fantastical, or nothing is supposed to be you know, um, um, like, I guess realistic is the mm -hmm. most basic way of describing it. Um, and, and, and going back to like, uh, the, uh, Kate or um, um, I think she, she, I think that's why I gravitated more, more towards her work is because she takes, um, it's almost, it's almost like a hyper-realistic view on, 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 on settings where it's, she takes the practicals that you think you'd see on set and kind of like just adds a little more of like aggressive touch, touch to them. Um, and so like that's, that's my, 
that's my, um, I guess, process is like I'll go in as we're scouting. I'll look at what's, you know, what's on frame and what's in set um, and then just kind of go, go from there. I don't like to like alter too many, too many things because mm -hmm. um, I think that it's, it's better to almost like put um, like a boundary or, or kind of like lock yourself, like kind of put uh, chains on yourself to like restrict you from other things. That way what you're able to focus more on, on what that scene is supposed to look like and, and um, your, your attention to detail is far greater than like if you started to like add what, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, I think that's why I also like shooting just like on real locations more is because you have those physical barriers, whether it be walls or windows or, or anything that you're having mm -hmm. to work uh, with as opposed to against. Yeah. Great. Um, so when you're planning for a scene, do you have a specific process and a way that you approach how you're, how you're gonna light it, I guess? I think the the uh, yeah the first part is like what so what what time of day are we shooting um, you know what as far as like the the um, you know when when I work out the storyboard with the with the director like what what we think is the best way to 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 go about that um, uh, a big issue is maybe you're shooting a super long scene you know a five six page. Uh, scene with all dialogue in, um, you know, like a daylight uh, uh, interior, like interior, um, like living room, and and you know that because you can't shoot over that two days, that you know maybe you want to start with the wides, and it's a lot easier to um, if you start losing light, it's a lot easier to bring that in on a close up than it is on you know, a master. Mm -hmm. And so those are the things, like, there's there's so many different things that I've definitely, like, um, when I first started out, like, I kind of shot myself into a corner because I didn't know what what to do. I didn't know what what issues would arise as mm -hmm. you're, you're doing certain things. And, and so um, now, like, it's, there's, there's, yeah, something like that or, um, uh, it just and, and and even like you know something like someone's schedule like you might only have an actor for half the day and so you have to shoot their scenes out um, um, and I guess this is kind of going off on a tangent but <laughs> like there's there's so many things that that um, come along with that initial setup that that uh, um, it's just like you have to like run into those issues. Um, before you kind of know uh, what to do, I guess, yeah. Off of that sort of, um, the balance between a director and a cinematographer, I've noticed sometimes their roles kind of fudge a little bit in the middle and it depends on the director or the cinematographer mm -hmm. as far as um, sometimes cinematographers slightly involve themselves in blocking because of how the lighting is set up or you know, they might determine a little bit more, okay, we're gonna do the wide first, and then how do you kind of work through with a director in the beginning to see like what what decisions are gonna be made by who, or do you always kind of do it together, or? Yeah, I definitely, definitely do it together as well as like, you know, you, you bring the, the actors in the scene um, too, because like, you know, say, say um, it's a, fairly emotional scene um, and, and just even between a wide and a tight, like you're, the actor is going to have to change to some degree. And like, so I think that, that um, it's just like, it's also, it's going back to like uh, the whole, like making it every, sh making sure everyone is comfortable on set. Like, mm -hmm. I feel like, um, you know, actors are often like, um, Kind of just treated like like bodies to a certain degree, and so yeah. When I'm talking with the director about that, like it's it's like, well, you know, is there a certain thing that would make the actor more comfortable in that situation? Um, um, 
and and then also like you, you know you you don't want to uh, and and this goes back to like shooting yourself in the corner where you never want like I've had times when like you light for the wide you shoot the wide <clears throat> and this this has happened a little bit more on the commercial side you move to like a medium shoot the medium go to a close up and then they'll want like an alt thing for the wide mm -hmm. and then you have to go back you have to reset certain things which takes like you know it can take like 30 minutes to do and so the stuff like that um has been out of my control but it's always good to like um i think having that 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 um foresight that to to think like do we need something else in the wide for con for like whether it's continuity or an alt script or whatever um, it may be, like making sure that that is communicated right mm -hmm. then because it's fr yeah it's just frustrating. It's frustrating for everyone. It's it's mm -hmm. um, having to having to reset and it slows your day down and and then certain certain little things like that can then you know it, the uh, I guess like as far as trust the trust in whether it's the director or whatever, it, those things can kind of chip away at that. Okay. Um, so I think we're going to take a couple looks at some examples of yours. Um, go into those. So um, I don't know if you want to just go through and talk about maybe your motivation, what was going on in, in yeah. Jimmy's brain? Yeah, so this one was uh, from a music vid video we did with a local artist, um, Django. Um, and in this scene, it's kind of like a sort of like a dream-like sequence where um, uh, he's in bed with his, his girlfriend and it, it kind of like goes between like their breakup and then the beginning uh, of the relationship, and so um, I, right after the shot, he kind of like gets like pulled from the bed, and the sheets like wipe the frame, and then there's like the, you know uh, I think I I pulled the lens off as well, so it's all like this just like goes from this kind of like clear um, image, and and you know when you're in, I think I wanted to make it like slightly. Um, there's a lot of reds and blues that play throughout this. Mm -hmm. And so it goes from like a daylit scene in bed to, to this one um, um, and transitions within, within the same shot from daylit to red. And I think I was trying to like go, like kind of like start to blend all those other worlds in, in this one scene. Okay. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a fairly intimate moment as well um, where this was as far as like, uh, within the music video, there's this was like one of the only shots where he's looking directly at camera, which I think that when you have, um, you know, when you watch certain, there's, there's, you know, when you watch certain films where none of it is played from a POV, and then you, ha and then it switches to that, that one shot, I think that, that it's, it's pretty jarring uh, at the same time, like being pretty impactful. Um, and so I think that with that shot, we were trying to, we were trying to go to that effect. Okay. Yeah. And then um, this one uh, was from a couple years ago. It was from a short film uh, that I did with Adam, who's operating on the other side of this. Uh, what's up, Adam? Uh, and so this was uh, uh, this was a film about a guy who's like living the last week of his life, um, and it's basically he knows when he's going to die. Um, and, and Adam and I had talked about, um, you know, ways of, of ending it. Uh, and this is like one of the last shots where I think just this, um, this is like one, probably one of my, uh, as far as the things that I've shot, this is one of my favorite, favorite, um, frames. Um, and, and it's just his acceptance of, of death. Um, and, and, you know, in this scene, the light, like lightning starts to roll in and, and um, there's just like this certain like tranquility that you get f whenever you shoot on a lake and when you, when you have that reflection, like it's, it's something that, that we kind of thought like that would, there's no better way to end this film 
than than uh, a shot like this. And yeah, like this this I think to this day like it's always it's always one of my favorite shots for sure. Yeah. Do you like to invoke metaphors or um, do you just try to go more for feeling? Like, do you try to kind of maybe layer some hidden things in your shots to, to add to them, or do you just try to go off of gut feeling? I think it's more gut feeling for sure. I think they're, they're, like that shot is probably one of the few shots where like there is a bit of underlying, like, you know, a metaphorical mm -hmm. like meaning behind it. But I think more often than not, I, I just like seeing like just like intimate moments between two people um, and showing their faces and letting you know, giving them an environment that they can do that. Like, um, 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 and they, f uh, if it's like, there was another scene in that film where it's a scene between him and a girl that he's been with for the past week and they're in a motel room. I think that, that, you know, when you're doing that, you want to, you know, you obviously you want the scene to like, uh, 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 I guess, be, to some degree, like visually metaphorical, but like, you know, you, you they're supposed to feel like very, um, uh, uh, like emotionally, like naked to some degree. And mm -hmm. so there was just like lit by one practical lamp, uh, like just the light on a light stand in the back. And, and, and I think that's more of what I kind of gravitate and what I enjoy more is like creating scenes where uh, I think cinematography on a whole should never call attention to itself. Mm -hmm. And it should be there to, to drive the story, you know, um, what the director has, has in mind, um, and then allow the actors to do what they need to do. And, and sometimes that calls for an elaborate setup, but some, and on some other times it just calls for, you know, one practical lamp in the back and just kind of like accentuating that. And so, uh, and that's something, I guess, kind of going off on a slight tangent like that is something that um, I definitely kind of like learned over the course of however many years I've been doing this. Like, at first I was like, oh, does this look good? Does this not look good? And I know that's subjective, mm -hmm. but that's like the last thing I think that, that cinematographers should be thinking about. It's like, yeah, that, like, it, yeah, it looks, it looks good, but, um, what does this do? Like, what does this do to drive the story? Um, and that, yeah, and that took me years and years and years um, to kind of like be able to like differentiate between those two those two things. I think that's one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of people make in the beginning is they're like, oh, that's just so pretty. Like, yeah. just. But what does it do for the story? I mean, the whole the whole point is to tell the story, and the trick of being a really good cinematographer is to do it in a way that the images are beautiful, but it's because they're, you know, giving to the story. Yeah, yeah, and, and that's why usually like, um, um, uh, like just, like examining a frame is, is great, but like, yeah, what does that serve in the context mm -hmm. of the film? And then this was, uh, this, I think this is the only like commercial still, but this is from a campaign that we did for 1-800-CONTACTS um, uh, last year. Um, and we, I don't, I don't do many things where we shoot uh, with like big built sets, but we rented out a warehouse um, and then built like four or five, I forgot how many, like just ma pretty massive sets. And this is kind of supposed to be, uh, um, just like, you know, a very clean looking interior apartment, but also like, you know, kind of breaking, it's not supposed to be like super realistic. Mm -hmm. Um, it's all, it's still kind of supposed to be set in like a very like, you know, uh, I guess traditional like set feel and way. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, this one, I, I, uh, uh, as far as like the breakdown, like we had some, the, the lights reading on the on the back wall are a little bright. I think that's just due to the monitor, but um, but we had like a huge like 12 by 12. I guess I can kind of go into like the technical side sure. a little bit of it. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, like a 12 by 12 uh, overhead that was basically like it, we were I was bouncing four 1Ks into it, and then uh, underneath that uh, there's a 12 by 12 silk. So it's just like a huge like book light essentially. Mm -hmm. 
um, over overhead, um, and then we had when you usually when you usually do that, you kind of have to because it's so soft and it spills everywhere, and there are white walls and white curtains that we had to like you know um, uh, uh, have these huge like kind of black duvetine rags that were kind of creating they ba they basically just create it so there's like uh, the light isn't hitting the back wall as much as it's hitting the, the subject. Um, and then there, there's a practical in the back, um, and then kind of like, uh, I think two other, uh, 2Ks from the back of the set shining through uh, the, the windows and, and the sheared um, curtains. Um, but yeah, this is supposed to be like a, a, just a mix between like a set and then like, like kind of a realistic um, location, but yeah, I think that I just like this one because it's yeah, it's it's so clean, which is usually kind of like the opposite, I guess, of what I normally do. And and I think that that the rest of the commercial is pretty similar to this, and it was uh, I think that that it definitely challenged me because uh, it's it's yeah, it's like normally not what I do, but I I. I took that, um, I took like the little things that I, I my own flavor and I kind of mix that in occasionally into the spot, but yeah. Well, it's nice because immediately looking at it, I can tell it's a commercial. I yeah. Mean, it just has, has that overall feel to it. Yeah. Um, do you find that you have more ability to use more lights and take more time to shape and to really hone in things on a commercial versus on a more narrative project? I, I, you, generally, yeah, yeah. Generally, you do because you're not having to, um, you're not having to go through as many setups um, um, as as you would, on, and you're not having, you know, to get this. Most of the stuff we do doesn't have like di dialogue, and so you're working with a 30 second spot that has under 10 setups for the day. So. You better make sure that everything looks like polished and everything. There's there's no there's nothing like there's no super glaring like mistake in it. Um, mm -hmm. I think that sometimes on the feature side, like you just don't have time. Like you just kind of have to like go with the flow. Uh, uh, and and there's de there's there's benefits to both. And because um, I do appreciate that side where it's just like on the feature side where like if you're not thinking. Like in a second, then 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 something else. I guess something else will happen. Then mm -hmm. you always have to be on your feet. Um, um, but at the same time, like stuff like that, like to, like polish stuff like that is a little bit more. Um, you just yeah, you just have that more, more leeway on on the commercial side. Okay. And this one, um, so this one was from. Another uh, is is kind of like a long form commercial slash short film that we shot uh, out in Sandpoint, um, and it's kind of got some like apocalyptic vibes to it. I'm sure you know nothing about that, <laughs> uh, uh, um, but like they're running away from uh, this huge like storm, mm -hmm. and it's a family of three. And um, this is kind of like right, like right in the middle, like after like there's it's 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 been complete chaos up until this point, and they find this like abandoned um, car lot, and they take shelter in one of the cars, and and this is like the first moment that um, uh, you kind of see the characters break a little bit, um, and and as just as far as like. Um, uh, nighttime stuff. I know it's pretty dark on the monitor right now, but there's a little detail in the back. Um, like I'm not as, uh, I'm not as, uh, um, I don't do as much d uh, nighttime exterior stuff um, just because it involves a lot more and the stuff that we're usually on, um, we usually, we ride around it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this was, this was fairly simple. I think I just had, again, um, uh, a huge like twelve by twelve um, a book light right outside like the back window, and then that was just kind of also hitting the back the cars in the background 
uh, and we just like played it really dark and like I, I really like this one because um, you can you kind of get this like silhouetted figure from the profile right before this and then he turns and like as he turns like there's just like a tear dropping down like his just like it's just the lights just like barely catching uh, the tear on his cheek and yeah I think that that one this the scene played really well and you know I, I, I consider I didn't have too much um, uh, expert like expertise or or uh, knowledge about shooting nighttime exteriors like I think this one actually played out pretty well yeah uh, and then this one was from uh, same film uh, this was the uh, the grandpa uh, basically listening into the um, uh, the other side of of the apocalyptic event and like trying to communicate with the family. Um, so this is in his bunker, and so I guess this goes back to like uh, motivating from practical light, mm -hmm. where you see you see the lantern in the back, you see the death light right in front of him, and I just like in this one. Um, it was really just uh, uh, motivated from, the, we had you know the desk light, the desk lamp, and then I had like a, um, uh, a Chinese lantern, um, um, which is something that I, I've used quite a bit, and they're extremely cheap, and I think mm -hmm. as far as like budget filmmaking, that's like a, that should be like a go-to, um, because what they do um, compared to how much they are, like, it's kind of a no-brainer with certain things like that because, like, that's the, I really just had the a Chinese lantern um, skirted for his key, um, and then skirted so it wouldn't hit the background, and then just another Chinese lantern to like barely, barely illuminate over the top um, where you see the, the 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 lantern, and and that was it. So it was just two um, two Chinese lanterns. And two practicals, um, and yeah, I was, I was pretty happy with this scene as well. Um, um, it's a little like Dolly pushing uh, as he's like listening to, to uh, um, the the thread at the beginning, where he's kind of like listening in to uh, all the events that that are that are happening, and you know the shock and uh, uh, awe of of the situation. So. And just to get into like. Uh technical terminology when you say skirting mm -hmm. um, can you explain to people what that means so yeah skirting like um, so say if you had like with 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 that scene and with like this uh, the commercial like you have it's generally with, like a bigger softer source where because because of that it's going to want to spill the lights were gonna want to go everywhere mm -hmm. and so with that you have to control that a lot more than like say if you had just like a Fresnel with barn doors where it's hard but you can focus it into an exact spot that you mm -hmm. want it to be. With soft light you don't have just the just the nature of it that you have to you have to have the ability to like uh, uh, determine where it goes and so when you skirt like it could be it could be I've done it where you know on a budget where you just wrap plastic bags uh, plastic garbage bags around something. Um, it, 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 it could be any black material or any um, um, material that doesn't allow light to, to, to black is usually the go-to because you don't want, um, like say if it was like, I don't know, red or something like that, then you're gonna get a little bit of that red hue and spill onto mm -hmm. whatever parts you don't want to, but it can be anything that's black. Um, um, and, and you just wrap that around your source and then that allows you to control where it's going more directly. And so, yeah, with this scene, there was just, the, the Chinese lantern was just sitting like almost right next to the lamp, um, just barely uh, accentuating um, uh, the right side of the actor's, actor's cheek. Um, and then the other Chinese lantern in, in the back is uh, you can kind of see like a little bit of like a soft rim light on 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 the left side of um, his head and so uh, and bo yeah both of those were skirted so they wouldn't spill all over the back the back wall okay. uh, and then this 
was from uh, another commercial. Uh, we actually shot this uh, over at Durkin's. Um, and it's supposed to kind of be like a cool hip bar. It's for, uh, we did this for like a straight razor company where everything's supposed to be, I don't know, I cool and that. hip and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, this one was just, uh, there was uh, right off the right side of this, I guess starting from the back, there was just another practical lamp that was kind of like, um, um, yeah, it's just eliminating the, the painting. And then overhead, there was a, a, a Kino, a four-baked Kino that we slightly diffused. And then you can kind of just see like a slight warmer light um, uh, on, on his right side, right far side that is being, uh, I think that was just like another Kino. And um, I guess as far as uh, what I like to do it when um, in situations like this, like you set the white balance, uh, so like what the camera, I guess what the camera um, is reading as far as like color temperature, I think I set this like at um, 4,000, so whatever is daylight, whatever is like normally, uh, like all these lights are, 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 are daylight balanced, um, uh, so whatever is uh, cooler than that will read bluer like you see um, coming from the uh, top of him, and then whatever is warmer, which are most like you know tungsten practical lamps, will read a lot warmer. And and I guess this was going back to like uh, this is when I first started to get uh, like watch a lot of like the Kate um, Kate Rizmendi's work, uh, where uh, it, you take uh, uh, you take an environment and you just basically accentuate and kind of make it just slightly more aggressive than what you normally see that 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 same environment uh, in person um, so yeah this 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 was from that commercial and yeah so is that is that making it more aggressive is that part of your motivation for mixing color temperatures or in other situations where you mix color temperatures what generally is your motivation for that um, I think in, yeah and something like that where the commercial overall has a, a, a lot more aggressive tone than than um, the creating a color contrast as opposed to just like a lighting contrast I think it's it's a very and like you, it, I think more, more definitely, it's become like a popular, more like theme more and more. Mm -hmm. um, but I always like to do it on set as opposed to in, in, in post. Um, um, but yeah, like I think that, that I don't get the opportunity as much to do something like this. Um, but but. It's 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 something that I really really kind of I probably gravitate more towards in terms of like what I would consider my style. Um, this darker definitely it's a lot darker than what um, some of the other images. Um, it's it's a lot more um, like colorful um, uh, and and yeah I think that that as far as like creating a contrast within the um, the frame, creating a color contrast is is. Gen something I yeah like I, I I lean more towards to than just a just a general lighting contrast. Cool. Yeah. And this uh, this one was from a, a commercial that we did um, out in the Yakima Valley um, uh, um, where we're shooting. There's just huge like uh, um, barley um, crops and. We had um, all these doctors and nurses that 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 uh, came in for um, Virginia Memorial, and um, it's just like a, you know dolly in. I think this one again, going back to like the one eight hundred contacts commercial. This one was supposed to be like a super clean um, image where uh, uh, we just kind of played. Is just supposed to kind of like accentu accentuate like. Um, uh, sort of like a slight sunsetty sort of vibe, and we shot this at sunset. And again, we had another uh, 12 by uh, off camera right um, that had two 1200 HMIs with uh, like half CTO on them. And and this one was just one one setup, uh, and we kind of like prepped and set up uh, a couple hours prior, then we shot it like at, or like at six or seven, uh, right at dusk. Um, 
but yeah, the, this one, um, again, I, uh, super clean image, um, and I feel like a lot of the, at least a lot of the commercial work that I do is generally, generally leans more into, into this, where, uh, um, you know, you're, you're, you're just making everything as like pristine as possible. Sure. And then this one is from a personal project we did a couple, I kept, did a couple of years ago. It's for a local artist, uh, Water Monster. Uh, and we shot it uh, in the old building. What was the one? It's the old building off of Sprague that Z Nation the, did like the, the uh, had like the base, like the camp at. Oh, the school? The yeah, the, sc yeah, school? the school. Yeah. yeah, so we shot this like right before, I think they demoed it, right, right like right oh, after. Wow. <laughs> um, and this was one where we just kind of like walked, I mean, I, don't, I think, because you, you were in this, you were in this building too? Yeah. 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 Like you go down Sarah's and it was like, it was crazy. Like it was so, like the, there's a, like old like, still like kind of like classroom like setups to some degree. And so this is in just one of those rooms and, and this is this is I, I you know this is one, another one of my favorite film uh, frames, where uh, you just play like, it's just all natural light, um, and it was just like a slight uh, dolly back and kicked a little bit of the dust up in the air. But I think this goes back to like something you know like what we talked about with location scouting, like you sometimes first you decide what uh, a location is going to serve to your story. And then you go out and you look for something that, uh, if you don't have too many resources, what is that? What location is going to allow you to 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 recreate what you have in mind uh, with with those like allotted resources? And this, you know, we we shot we shot a music video in this building in like four or five hours, and it's because every room that you went into was just like was just perfectly set up for for the type of song and for the type of look that we wanted to go for. And um, yeah, that go, goes back to location scouting where mm -hmm. if you find, if you take the time uh, in pre-production to properly scout it, on, when you're on, on the day, everything is gonna go so much faster um, um, yeah, if you just put that, that little bit more effort into, into finding that location. Yeah, yeah, finding a good location is so key to yeah. so much. And especially like sometimes a director or a cinematographer will look at a location and they'll see this one shot and this one frame and they forget that very often with the camera we have to look around. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's really lucky when you can find a location that's just the whole thing. Yeah, is, yeah. It's great. Okay, so the last slide we're going to go to a daylight exterior. And then this is, I think we're gonna play, yeah. So this is a, this is the same film that the uh, the shot of the guy standing in the boat out in the lake. Um, so yeah, this this is uh, this kind of goes back to I guess as far as like scouting and then the resources. Like uh, Adam and I had scouted this uh, for quite a while, and the only thing that we really brought with us was uh, just a four by four reflective card um, and that could be uh, anything, anything white that, that is able to, to, to bounce light back up. And, and we knew um, and we went down here when we were scouting to the time of day that we were, we knew, we knew that like, you know, because of the bridge and we, we wanted some light in there, most of the day that bridge would kind of like obstruct a lot of the, the, the sun that was coming in, and so we knew that we had to shoot this later on in the day when um, um, the light was coming. You know, as you can see, like the light is coming like almost directly behind them, mm -hmm. uh, like parallel um, to them. Um, and so, yeah, that, that that goes back to scouting, where if we would have just shown up, uh, what if we would have shown up at a random time? Uh, I think the scene would have have been as impactful or would have been a lot more difficult for us to, to shoot it the way we wanted to shoot it. And so when you, when you, do, when you do the scout, um, um, then when, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're going to shoot it, like it, we shot this thing in under, in under an hour and just with, just with uh, a bounce board and, and, um, and, and a camera, obviously. But um, 
but yeah, and like you can see a, in this thing, you can see like a slight, like it, I think there's, there are clouds that are rolling in um, um, that kind of shifted the light to some degree, but um, that's kind of sometimes expected when you're shooting exteriors. Um, but yeah, like that was that that's it. That was that was pretty much it. Um, um, so I guess that kind of goes back to like, you know, it's nice having tools and and everything, but sometimes those tools be, can become a detriment where you feel like you need to use them mm -hmm. um, um, just because they're sitting there. Uh, and and it's funny because like you know. Um, I've, you know when you when I'm shooting commercials and whatnot, and you have this huge like two ton or three ton truck that's sitting outside that the client's looking at, and like <laughs> they're paying thousands of dollars for what, um, and then all you're using is uh, the camera and just like a, a little piece of white foam, and and mm -hmm. and sometimes that's all that it calls for. But sometimes you know it's 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 you need other things, but uh, but you know it's it's I, I feel like. Um, yeah, you shouldn't. You should never use something just for the sake of using it. It should serve the uh, the story or purpose. It should. It should. It should be there for something. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes when you work on a commercial, do you feel like you have to maybe like showboat a little and yeah. just make it seem like a lot bigger? You know, a lot more complicated than it might y actually yeah. be. Yeah, that's def that's def that's definitely there. Um, 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 where, you know, yeah, you'll you'll throw up a couple extra things just, just yeah, just for the show, just for the show, um, um, and then and you'll like most times um, when I'm looking at I actually won't say that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I think I think that 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 um, because you have so much more time um, 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 that. You, uh, you 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 kind of want to put on yeah a little bit more of a show which I I I do I I I understand I completely understand I do enjoy it I do enjoy kind of like busting out all mm -hmm. the things that I normally don't get to to use um, but uh, with with that film like you know uh, I think at the at the core of what I do that's more of what I I I, I kind of see myself as. Just like using the environment uh, to to tell the story, as opposed to me artificially um, um, making something. Right. Okay, so I think we're gonna move on to doing a three-point lighting setup. Um, yeah. If you want to just while you're starting, maybe explain to people what the concept of three-point lighting is. Yeah. It's one of the most you know yeah. basic. Yeah. So. Uh, what we will start with, um, so so what I'm going to set up is basically like what would what three point lighting would be say um, in like an in, like an interview like I'm I'm going to set up to interview, um, um, and then we can kind of play with it a little bit more. Here, I'm going to restart this game. So I guess while you're going through that, um, when I went to school for film, you, you learn a lot about the rules of cinematography. So three-point lighting is kind of one of them, rule of thirds, um, you know, 180-degree line, those types of things. They're rules, but very often are broken. But yeah. do you think it's important for people to learn them before they break them? Yeah, I think that, that as far as learning the fundamentals of something before you um, kind of like destroy or break them down is is pretty key because um, sometimes you need, like more often than not, you're going back to the fundamentals um, when you're making a film or when you're making a commercial. And there are, there are some unique situations that call for something different, but, but yeah, like, m m I would say a majority of the time that I'm shooting something, I'm going back to this. Um, and so learning three-point lining, uh, uh, that's something that uh, yeah, every person should kind of like have 
uh, make themselves familiar with mm -hmm. when, when they start. And so with that, um, the first thing that is kind of going to, is going to make, uh, or is going to set, set your scene, allow you to uh, alter uh, your other lights um, afterwards uh, is your key light. And that's generally the thing that's um, illuminating the subject that's on frame, that's in camera. Um, 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 and so what I'm going to do, what I'm gonna set up first, is that this is, um, we have uh, Aperture 120, uh, it's just an LED, um, and, and the softbox um, allows me to like soften the light so there's not super harsh shadows. Uh, and this is, I, I'd say, I, I prefer softer light. I think with all those examples that I showed um, previously, there's something to that degree, but just in a bigger form. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we can start, we can start by, by showing this one. Um, so I'll just power this on here, and then I'll probably dial that down just a bit. So I'll set this up. So like I said, like uh, we'll we'll go over three point lighting just like in terms of um, say we're lighting an interview, and so usually uh, you want it to be like so you have like kind of like three quarter frontal, so you have like a little bit of contrast. Let's see if I can see what I'm doing here. <laughs> um, uh, you know, not nothing. The shadows shouldn't be playing too harsh. Um, um, and then we can start to kind of uh, move this around after we have set um, our other lights up. So, Darren, could you actually bring the, these lights down just a little bit more? Yeah, that's, that's perfect, thank you. Um, so yeah, like I said, like with, with the softbox, like you can kind of see that um, the shadows, like everything is falling very nicely uh, across your face um, and, and the shadows from your nose and then from, from the chin aren't, aren't harsh in any way. And if I took this off, you'd get a lot, a lot harsher and a lot longer lot of shadows falling across. So with that, I'll just move this a little bit more to the side so we can kind of see how that affects, how that affects um, the, the shadows and, and just the nature of the light. And then uh, we can also play with the, f the fill light a little bit more. So what I did is <clears throat> uh, I just moved it farther, basically farther away from the camera and more towards her left side. Um, so I can do that. I'll do that one more time just to kind of like show what that is doing um, to, to the light. Uh, see, that is just more of, um, I think, this... This is kind of what I created in that one hundred contacts commercial where it's very like it's very like it's like a beauty light essentially, mm -hmm. but like a huge soft beauty light where it's it's frontal um, it's it, uh, there's really no shadow there's there's nothing there it's like all very soft beauty light but let's just move this back back over for now so there we have our key the key like I said the key uh, uh, determines every other light that you set up um, on set. Um, and it's something that, that I definitely, when I first started out, like, I think I would get ahead of myself and I would like, be too concerned about other things that, other like, extraneous things that really didn't matter at the end of the day. And I would, uh, again, it's, it's going back to working yourself in a corner where I would light background, whatever, accent, like accentuate other things. And then I would like get to my key last and then I had to go back and change every other thing in the back. Mm -hmm. and, and that's something that I think that through time and error, through trial and error, like I, I, I just like had to focus, I think because I get too scatterbrained sometimes. Uh, but, but the key is the first thing that you set up uh, uh, in a scene. Um, next thing we'll move on to is is our fill light, and a fill light can be two different things. It can be a, several different things, but it's it's there to fill in um, the shadows that you'll see on on the the right side of, of your face. And and like I said, that can, that can be 
another light, uh, which I generally don't uh, uh, use um, because I feel like it, it's, it, a fill light should be there to, it should be like an extension of the key and not mm -hmm. something entirely separate. But, but just for the sake of the um, uh, setting it up, we'll first start with, um, we'll first start with just using an actual light. I sticky stand. I remember uh, one of the first cinematography classes I took, uh, we had a subject sitting in a chair and then we just had, the teacher just walked a light in a circle around the person and you realize like how many different feelings you get just based on how light casts shadows on someone's yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's, I mean, I think anyone that hasn't done that that wants to get into cinematography should just see do what that, that and just see yeah. how, that, how that goes. Yeah, and I think after we kind of like just go through this three-point lighting then we can see, yeah, what it's like to, to underlight someone, what it's like to have like a top light, um, what it's like to have you know, extreme um, um, like silhouette or something like that to, um, um, but yeah, for now, so I'll, I'll power this one on and then I'll bring it down quite a bit. And, and yeah, like you'll, you'll see this is about 40%. So it's filling in those shadows. Um, uh, it's not making it as contrasty, but I, f with me, like I, there's always a, like a just like an artificialness to to using another light as a fill light um and and as i bring it up the you know you'll you'll get more towards like a one to one um uh contrast ratio um so that is completely flat for the most part um but yeah just j you just for the sake of the workshop we'll turn that off for now and then another thing that um you, I usually do uh, uh, as a fill light is just more of a fill from a reflector like we had you know, talked about. Uh, it can be anything. It can be a piece of uh, a foam. It can be one of these little guys that you can, you know, you can get these things on Amazon for $10 and, and we'll use um, the white side. And so basically what I'm doing is I'm just reflecting the light off of our key back onto your fill side. And, and so it's a lot more subtle of effect. Um, see if I can, I'll bring it in just a little bit closer. Um, yeah, it's just a lot more subtle of effect I feel uh, as far as lighting someone than bringing in a completely separate light. Because uh, you're using, yeah, you, I'm just using the same source, but I'm, like I said, accentuating uh, what that source is and I'll take it away, and we can see that that contrast ratio is back to where we started. But let me see if I can clip this on. To, or and do you sometimes make considerations for like an eye light? Like for example, if if you have two lights, then sometimes you can see two eye lights. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're just reflecting, then it's not really going to create it's something not, in the eye. Yeah, and so uh, and so I'd say more often with commercial work, I'll have that you know beauty light just so you so you, you know you never really all the all those, all those kind of like clean images like you never want to see like um the you know someone's like darker pupils like you want that little glean in their eye like mm -hmm. like you had mentioned and so something like this i probably wouldn't uh employ as much as i would like on 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 a, a film um so i'll just set this up for now Since you're playing with it, what do you call the clamp that you're uh, this <laughs> attaching is, that to? This is a, a, a Cardellini, so, and then this, this other device that stand that I have is called a C-stand, and these are, are two pretty common things that you'll see on set. Uh, a C-stand is, is, is something that, that, that is, is so, uh, what is it, I guess universal, and it has so many different purposes that, that um, 
yeah, you, you see these things, the, the, the stand, there's a stand, and then the cardellini is there to go into the head of the stand, and then this cardellini can clamp onto anything. It can, it can be used uh, in so many other ways that I, 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 I don't <laughs> even know. <laughs> uh, but we'll just set this roughly right here for now. And I might walk this, I'll walk this key around just a little bit more. Just barely. And then, yeah, then like the last, the last part of a, of a three-point lighting setup is, is your backlight. It's going to be the thing that separates your subject from the background. Um, and with this, um, uh, as far as like lighting, a uh, traditional just like interview, I, I tend to put um, the backlight opposite side of the key just so you can have that balance and contrast. Um, um, and I'll, I'll switch it on here just to kind of show you what I'm talking about. I'll bring this down quite a bit. All right, let's see here. Hopefully this doesn't hit the, okay. And so yeah, this is, this is something to, it just kind of like brings the image image to life to certain to a certain degree it's 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 like i said it's the thing that separates you from and it's a little bit harder on a back on just like a white wall so say if we had uh uh just if we're in like a just a living room where you have more points of reference and a deeper depth then a backlight would would come more into play but for now um we can just kind of show you like what that does um, on the back side. And so, like I said, like going back to um, having my backlight on most, like just a traditional interview, like having my backlight opposite side of my key, it creates that, that contrast um, uh, uh, in light where, say if I moved it over to your left side, then you, you, you still have it, but you kind of lose it more because your, I'm lighting a side of your face that's already lit as opposed to lighting like your fill side where it's just a touch bit, it's like it's a little bit darker. Um, you can, you're able to read that a little bit more. Um, so yeah, as far as a three point lighting, that's, that's, you know, that's it. And again, like, like we were talking about, uh, you can, you can, you learn this and then, and then when you get onto set, you won't really, like when you're film when you're when you're shooting a film like this type of stuff is you'll you'll have to uh, deploy that in a different way like mm -hmm. this isn't you'll never have like ideal situations like this so if you're we, we, I just go back to like the living room like your your key may be coming from a window that you have to stick a light outside the window to 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 bring that in or it may be from like the, the, you have a family sitting at a dining room table, and the key might be the overhead light above above the table. And so, like, the key is never it's never just this. It's always whatever is 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 uh, illuminating the subject or subjects uh, uh, directly in, in your frame. Um, and so, I guess we can kind of like we can kind of see what happens like as far as like other you know, if, if it's, if it's, if I'm doing like a horror film or if I'm doing something else, like I'll start to move this light around. So like you said, like with your instructor, what that affects, how that affects, like how the audience is, is seeing, um, the, the, the subject. So we'll just take, we'll take this off. Um, so like say, yeah, say, uh, if I was, shooting a horror film, and this is, you know, um, um, the, the quickest way we can, we can show this, but, um, you know, you, I wanted to uplight, and, and you, so you have these, like, shadows that are, are, are basically falling upwards um, to some degree, and, and so we can do this, and then we can also play with um, uh, color temp to a degree, so uh, going back to color temperature, like, Right now, I have it 
balance. And this isn't as uh, this isn't as <laughs> horror-ish, <laughs> just because we have a, a softbox on it. But I guess I could move that other light. Um, but let's just go with this for now. <laughs> I can probably take this off and uh, we get a little bit more. One thing I thought was interesting is that you can light, say someone was accused of murder mm -hmm. and you're interviewing them. The person that's lighting that has some impact into how people are going to see them and how they might think that they did it or they didn't do it because you can just yeah. make them seem more ominous or more innocent. And, and that's, some, yeah, that's exa exactly, that's, that's something that you can play in your favor of like, of, of either kind of like concealing or misleading the audience um, or, yeah, like, or having like these things that, these like super subtle things that are building throughout a film that you don't necessarily like recognize, but when you, when the reveal happens, all that stuff makes sense, like you know, like like you were saying, and and yeah, it's something that that and go, going back to going back to the whole idea of uh, being a cinematographer and in my early like stages, like oh, does this look good or does it not look good? Mm -hmm. Like that that is is at the core of of that question. Like it's not that doesn't matter. Like what matters is that what you're doing to affect the audience. And what you're doing in the, in that scene, um, uh, uh, so the whole the whole aspect of it looking good, yeah, is not as crucial as what that is what it's doing to someone's subconscious. Um, and, and and yeah, because when you when you watch like I, I know like uh, stuff like like documentaries and things like that are becoming more and more popular, and like yeah, those might not look as good but like they're 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 doing visually what they should do like they're there to serve the story they're mm -hmm. there or like say like a sitcom um like i i um like you go back like i've just been rewatching like parks and rec and like yeah that might not look as good as like uh a steven spielberg film but <laughs> it's doing what it needs to do in mm -hmm. that context and so that's something, yeah, that's something that took me a long time to understand what cinematography actually meant, um, where it has tons of different faces, uh, um, but like, and no one is better than the other. Um, um, it's as, as subjective as it gets, but yeah, like uh, that, that um, I think that that's something that, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a hard thing to grasp because uh, from the outside, most people look at a cinematographer as like, oh, that's the person that's like, you know, they, they like when people kind of like generally sum up a cinematographer, it's like they're there to just like make it look good. Yeah. Um, and it's so far from, from that actually. Yeah. But yeah, so um, yeah. We'll go. We'll switch out of the horror scene that wasn't as much of a horror scene as we were expecting it to be. <laughs> In a more technical sense, are there any lights that you really like to use for a certain reason, or lenses, or can I mean, like, do you have tools that are like your go-to zone projects if if you have that choice? I think um, in a very like most things we use. Uh, um, LEDs, uh, just thank you. Um, as far as being efficient, like you know, we're not uh, going to uh, locations and bringing a generator. So uh, our ability to uh, use house power um, and run off that uh, LEDs are, are what, we, what we what we primarily use. And then on bigger projects, I'll. You know, you'll have like your RAs and your reds and stuff like that, as well as lenses. But like most of the other stuff we do is like a, a fairly run and gun, and so we kind of switch between like the Sony FS7 and then uh, Black Magic, and and uh, especially Black Magic. Um, 
as far as like the the line between affordability and then like um, quality, like I, I don't think there's a better camera out there. Um, but yeah, like the 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 job should determine the camera and mm -hmm. not vice versa or the gear. Uh, um, um, and yeah, like I was like going back to like what I was saying about like having a truck sitting out uh, and not being used, like that that. You should, yeah, you should never f feel obligated to use to use certain certain pieces of equipment. Um, um, but yeah. That's so um, we're going to start getting into the Q and A portion of this section. I believe you can ask the questions online, and uh, we'll get them read out. All right, guys. Here we go. Um, our first question is what quality do you look for in directors that you like to work with? I think um, uh, the main one is just like, uh, and it's been a while since I've not worked with one that I'm like familiar mm -hmm. or friends with, um, but like I just like to, I just like to like talk with them uh, not about film at the beginning and just like see if like, we're, we're cool on, in, that, in that regard because um, you know as if you're if you're if you're gonna spend months or weeks or whatever um, working with them then you should be able to to, to enjoy being around them uh, not in the context of film so there's that there's also like um, you know their 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 ability to uh, to, to 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 listen their ability to uh, kind of like appreciate other people's ideas that they're bringing to the table and not like, you know, either dismiss them or just like, um, cause I've had that happen before, like where you feel like, you know, you're, you're I never want to feel like I'm talking at someone, I, you mm -hmm. know, you definitely want to talk with someone um, and, and, and you, you can kind of sense that pretty fast if like what you're saying isn't really being like processed. Um, and so those, those are the two biggest things. Like it's it's it's, uh, uh, yeah. I, as far as like our, I think having the same sense of of same sense of like visuals, the same sense of like anything film. I don't think that's as crucial because uh, if you do have opposing views or whatever, like that could only make your subject or your film more, that much more interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, um, because, like, I think thing, I think better quality comes out of out of that, out of opposition, than like constantly agreeing on on certain things. And like, there's a fine line, of course. Like, you don't want right. to be getting to be getting into arguments about everything, but you surely want to be able to like question um, um, motive or, or their motivation uh, in, in scenes or on a whole. Um, um, if if you feel like that is the environment that's being kind of created. Right. And just going off of that, I was just going to say, I think that it's really important for directors to really understand what a cinematographer does and, mm -hmm. and what their job entails so that when you're asking things of them, you kind of have the right language and understanding to know like what you're asking and how you're asking yeah. it. Because yeah. sometimes, you know, you can get on a set and a director usually early directors, but they don't really know anything about cinematography, so they might ask you to provide something for them that really needed to be planned like a week in advance, yeah. and it's just something that can't be done. So yeah. the more understanding that they have in general, I think, you know, it's really beneficial. Yeah, and that, and that also goes along with like, between a cinematographer and the, like, you know, we'd mentioned like the people uh, that you're working with mm -hmm. and the, the, like, the value in, in you know, being in different departments before you're being before you're you know going to um, uh, the cinematography role is 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 not necessary, but it, it sure does help. Where you uh, you you've seen what's happened on the other side, and mm -hmm. and um, you are you can sympathize more to, with them to a certain degree, and you also just know yeah, like as far as communication, you you, you know what to say and what not to say. Mm -hmm. um, which is pretty valuable. Sticking to that theme, uh, the next question is, do you prefer 
uh, with a, a director who comes in with specific ideas and shots and compositions, or do you prefer being the one making those decisions? I think um, uh, I would rather have the director first come with his vision and then, then um, being able to work off of that because uh, and this is a, this is like a pitfall that comes along with working with with newer directors is like they'll just come to you and they'll say like okay well how about you storyboard it out but that is such a that's such a big part in the process like I'm here to 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 make your vision that much clearer but I'm not I'm not here to like to to create what I think it should, it should be. Right. Um, um, and so that that's some. I think I think if I were to choose between one or the other, it'd definitely be someone bringing um, initially something to the table and then going from there, as opposed to to uh, me having to like to 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 work, yeah, to work that world because um, um, then it's it's not really the director's yeah the director's vision anymore. Yeah. yeah. Next question, uh, could you give the name of those two apps that you talked about? Yeah, uh, one is called Sunseeker and the other one is called Artemis, so A-R-T-E-M-I-S. -E I like Artemis. <laughs> I yeah, <something>. yeah. <laughs> uh, the next question, um, what do you enjoy more, shaping the light or hand, uh, hands on the camera and designing the movement? I think um, because I was m probably more from the camera side, being behind the camera is is uh, is something that I've always like gravitated more towards. Like I, I've done a little bit of electric, a little bit of grip, um, but but being behind the camera and and uh, um, being able to to to. Um, uh, being able to actually like physically change certain things, which I feel like other you know uh, those other departments you can't really you don't really have at your control, mm -hmm. um, especially when you're when you're filming like um, that you know if I want to if I want to move in a little bit closer if I want to you know uh, uh, do whatever when I'm behind the camera I, that I think that that I know that. Um, so there's like the cinematographers that I that I grew up with, and I was when I was going through film school, like they were always behind camera. Like you know, you have your Deacons, you have you have other, um, you have Lubetsky. Like think the people that that I think, if you want ultimate control, being behind the camera, uh, being in, because then you're in. I think you also develop a stronger bond with the actors because you're there. You're 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 in intimate scenes you're you're physically there with them and so the with that i think you also gain their trust more to a certain degree uh, than if you are the type of person that is just sitting behind a monitor behind video village all the time never never the only time you're being seen is when you're just adjusting lights um and so i think that there there is like yeah if i i would i i would never not want to be right behind the camera. Sticking with the idea of control, what's your opinion of designing a look? On camera, on set, or how much of it do you let go to post? Uh, I think it's always, you always want to have as much control on set as possible, mm -hmm. and and because you never know, and like, I, I, for me, like, especially the commercial side, like, since I'm, shooting it as well as taking it through post. Like I know what I can do and what I can't do uh, uh, when it comes to the post side. But like uh, when things are out of my control and out of my hands, like I want to make it look exactly how I think it should look on set and not not have that left up to someone else. Um, um, and also like, um, you know, this, this just kind of goes back to like creating um, in, environment that allows the actors to like feel like they're actually in there like if you're just like um, um, if you're just if you're just like 
uh, changing certain like uh, the, the the look and everything in post, and you're shooting it uh, in a in a pretty dull way, and it's not supposed to be that way, then then it's it might be uh, for the actor, it might be a lot more difficult for them to 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 put themselves in that situation in that scene than if I were to like you know um, say going back to like that that scene in like the bar, uh, uh, if everything was just like neutrally lit, then then it might not have the same effect um, as it, as if I were to like actually like change all the fixtures and everything, so you have that that amount of like color contrast and whatnot. Yeah. I know there's a lot of cinematographers that intentionally do things so that it can't be messed with later, mm -hmm. like using a lot that's burned into the film. Mm -hmm. um, or just using different techniques that are things that really you can't fix or change in post because maybe once it gets to post, the cinematographer might get to you know look at the coloring, but for the most part, they have been removed and then the producers come in and they didn't necessarily know the vision and they can kind of mess with it. So I know a lot of people that just that have just, their yeah. little tricks or like <laughs> intentionally under light things a little bit because they want it to be dark and they don't want you to bring it up. Yeah. Or lots of things like yeah. that. When do you prefer being brought into a project? At the early script level or after the script and in pre-production? I think that, um, um, I think as early as possible and, and um, because like uh, another maybe misconception that, that people had about cinematographers is like, you know, even though I'm not a script writer, I still have, I still know enough where I can have input whether it be like uh, from just a production standpoint, like certain things might not make as much sense, and then um, um, altering the story and around that. And I feel like it, I, just in terms of like talking about budget filmmaking, um, I I, th I think that 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 should definitely be um, um, that should be very people should be very aware of that where. Yeah, like you want to write certain things, but are you going to be able to film that? Like mm -hmm. you should. This should be a balance between uh, uh, production and and story. And yeah, maybe someday you'll you won't have to worry about the 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 financial uh, and production side of it. But right now, yeah, you, you're going to have to worry about about that. And so I think that that um, the projects that I have done, like just coming at it more from like a producer side uh, initially the sooner the better um, is what I what I generally um, prefer when you're looking at a script what are when you're reading it um, what are the things that you're thinking about as you're reading through it that that um, I think I like to I always like to have like a couple of read read throughs like the first is just like uh, uh, I, I, I just take it from a strictly like emotional, like how does this make me feel? Um, um, and I don't really like to think about anything else. It's very like, I, I, turn, I turn, you know, all my like film, tech, whatever side off. And it's like from, from just like an uh, audience point of view, like what, what is this making me feel? And, and if, it, if it's not like, you know, eliciting anything, then 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 I probably won't work on it. But then after the the second, third, fourth time, I think that's when I start to like break down, break it down, scene by scene. Then um, then you break it down like in, a, in an arc and like how you want, because you should have like the you know my, a big part is like you have to have a progression. You have to you can't have and you're often shooting these things out of order, and so you know that like um, if if you if you have a certain style for for one like a scene that if it, it comes early in the script you can't and if you're shooting that back to back with uh, another scene that comes later on in the film you can't have those two things be you know even though it might be easier or it might it might not be um, you know, might not be as aware of it like you have to have that has to be in the con constantly in the back of your mind, like uh, where this, where is this fitting into the script, um, and then what is that arc uh, um, um, that that I want to like um, kind of portray, 
Uh, and so those, yeah, those come third, fourth time um, af after reading it. Uh, and then, and then you work, start to work in the storyboard. And, um, but yeah, I think, I think always initially, like I, I just read it and, and I just read it strictly from a, uh, uh, from a out, outsider's perspective. Um, um, I think that, that that's maybe something that, um, kind of like, I might be a region, but like, uh, because I wasn't, I didn't like grow up loving, I, I, I didn't grow up like, I have some friends, yeah, like they knew that they wanted to do this for, since they were like six, seven years old. Um, and like, I, I've never been like that. Uh, I, I, I wasn't like that. And so I feel like I, I can kind of like throw on like a certain object, objectivity mm -hmm. uh, um, as far as scripts go. Okay, our last question. What is the most difficult shot you ever tried to get and how did you achieve that challenge? That one you wrote on? No, not really. You're working on Z Nation. No, I seriously said, except, I was gonna say, except for anything that Juan made you do, so. <laughs> what is the most difficult? Uh, let's see. Uh, huh. I would say that, um, That's a tough one, because the yeah, like as far as like physically demanding shots, like uh, I would safely shooting outside of a car, <laughs> <laughs> definitely secured well enough. <laughs> um, but hmm, um, I think I think there are the times when you're you're wanting. Uh, that magic hour look and like you're rushing towards that that one that one shot that like is going to make or break uh, and you only have like a 10 to 15 minute window like we and I've run into that a couple of times because um, you know the 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 I, I that's the you know there's a reason why it's called magic hour but uh, <laughs> I, there yeah there's definitely been a couple of times when like you're everything's fine and and you know what's coming, and then then something always inevitably goes wrong, uh, and and then you're having to like rush rush through that, um, and you're and you're sweating, and you don't want to mess up on the ca on camera, uh, um, but yeah, those those have been those those moments, and then I would say like uh, uh, when the the one eight hundred contacts commercial, like that's definitely the, one of the bigger productions that I've done on the commercial side, and. Not only that, but like lighting sets is something that I, I've never really done, and so uh, uh, that was a you know that was a learning process while while going through that, and and I feel like um, if that would have happened earlier on in my career, I, I definitely wouldn't have had both the confidence and the knowledge to adapt um, to adapt to that, yeah. But so yeah there's there's physically there's, there's yeah there's physical and then there's like mental challenges to to each one of those scenarios for sure so oh I, yeah so to sum up, is there anything like words of wisdom or tips or or anything that that you want to say I mean just personally, one thing I always tell anyone that's getting into film is you can't just like it, mm -hmm. you have to love it. Mm -hmm. Because like our lives, as cool as it seems, working in film, are extremely demanding, and our jobs are actually quite difficult. So, do you have any words of wisdom that you really like to? No, I, I mean that's definitely that's 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 that definitely be one of them. Because I, I feel like a lot of people have this like idealistic view of what it what working on set is, and 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 it's not like that at all. <laughs> um, both on the feature side and on the, on on the commercial side, like it's it can be. It can be a grind, um, and most often, more often than not, it is. Um, and the 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 there's there've been even now like I think uh, there have been so many times when I I like not only doubt um, but but just like uh, the f the f uh, there's also the fear because like I I know like I said like I. I didn't really apply myself in school. I uh, was never great academically. Um, I was 
the only thing I thought about was like playing soccer. Um, and so that fear has always kind of like crept um, um, into my mind. It's like, it's either, it's, it's kind of like this or nothing. Um, um, and so I think that, that you have to find things in your external life that aren't related to the film that, that allow you to, to, that give you that much more motivation to, to keep on doing what you're doing. Um, uh, and then just like in, in the context of, of being in, in, in Spokane or just like a slightly smaller market, like, I, you know, we previously mentioned like um, um, people thinking that your, your um, location or your, uh, if you if you move to LA, if you move to Seattle, if you move to Portland, to New York, or wherever, like that's going to instantly make the change. You it's going to you're going to you're going to be on the pathway to success, mm -hmm. um, um, whatever. Um, and 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 uh, I think that 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 is a thing that that you. Yeah, it's another thing you have to constantly remind yourself is like it doesn't. Your, your physical location does not matter. It's like what you're, you know, what you're willing to put into it, and um, um, and that's something that took me a long time because, like, I looked at my own when I first moved back to Spokane. I looked at my own, um, uh, like, I wasn't working much, um, and I definitely wasn't doing the things that I wanted to do, um, um, and and I looked at Spokane as like being the fault of that um and and it took me years and years and years to realize that like that's not the case at all um, um and i'm glad that i did um because i've known plenty of other people who've like just like call it off and said like mm -hmm. you know this isn't working so obviously it's not my fault it's something else it's something that, that uh, just an, another external force um um, so yeah, like I guess to sum it up, like uh, you you have to um, uh, even when you know you, everyone's going to struggle uh, once they once they if they're going through film school or if they're starting out in their career, everyone everyone's going to struggle, and uh, the ability to 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 kind of like keep that cl clear like clear vision um, and not let the other things that, that, that you think are stopping you um, um, actually stop you um, because, you know, Spokane has grown because of the people here and mm -hmm. because of, of, of um, the people who first, who first kind of like, no, I guess founded, founded isn't maybe the best word, um, but the people who had the ability to, to, to do exactly that were they don't see Spokane as a detriment. They see it as a place where there's tons of growth, um, um, and and the uh, those people then you have a much you have a greater ability to change what's going to happen in the future than if you were in a bigger city. And so yeah, like that that like I I don't want to be in another place other than here. Um, and I definitely didn't feel that way six, seven years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that's all okay. for, from us. Thanks, for, thanks yeah. for being here and sharing your knowledge. And uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in and hanging out with us for the morning. <laughs> Thank you to our sponsors. This program is made possible by the support of a saga grant from Spokane Arts. This has been a Spokane Film Project production in association with CMTV.